All right, next common pattern we'll see in synthesis. Uh, in this first step here, uh, I've got an alkane, and the only thing you can do is brominate it, and it will prefer the most substituted carbon, so we'll place the hydrogen on that tertiary carbon. So, and here we'll then have a tertiary alkyl halide. With a tertiary halide, we can't do SN2, but we can do E2. And the big key here, and again, big point for synthesis, is we have two different ways of accomplishing that E2. We can use a non-bulky base, like sodium methoxide, sodium hydroxide, sodium ethoxide, or we can use our bulky base, and we'll see a difference in whether we get the Zaitsev or the Hoffman product. And so Zaitsev product here, we get the more substitute alkene. Hoffman product, we get the less substitute alkene. And then we could go and do any one of our host of alkene reactions. So notice here, maybe I do uh, HBr with peroxide. And that adds H and Br anti-Markovnikov. And so in this case, we'd get the bromine ending up on the less substitute side. And in this case, we do form chiral centers, and there's no stereoselectivity, so we actually get a mixture of four different stereoisomers. Uh, if I did it on the other hand up here, HBr and peroxide, now I'd get the bromine ending on the less substitute side of this alkene out here, so in giving this product. And so here, depending on where we form the alkene, would affect where we can ultimately, in the end, get the bromine. So real common pattern in synthesis when you can form both a, a most substituted a Zaitsev alkene or a least substituted uh, a Hoffman or anti-Zaitsev alkene and then your different alkene reactions will end up with different uh, substituents in different locations. Real common pattern in synthesis. Okay, so if we take a look at uh, this example based on the common pattern synthesis we saw a second ago. Uh, again, we could try to work this forward or backwards. One thing we should realize though is that we're starting off with an alkane and once again the only thing you know what to, to do with, with an alkane is to simply add a good leaving group. So in this case we'll brominate it and that's going to put that good leaving group on the most substituted carbon, in this case the tertiary carbon. And so that shortens up the synthesis here. From here though we will probably try and work this backwards. So how do we get a bromine on that carbon? Well, uh, Br2 in light is not going to accomplish that, uh, so that's not going to work. Uh, question is, how else do I do it? Obviously, I can see that my seven carbons match up with my seven carbons here, so we're not affecting the length of the carbon chain in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and the only way you've really learned up till this point to get a bromine there is if you already had an alkene. And getting the bromine on that less substitute carbon right there would mean HBr and peroxide. We kind of looked at this when I went over the common patterns and synthesis here. Uh, from here then, the question is, how do you make an alkene? Well, we already have a good leaving group, and once we have a good leaving group, we can simply do E2 elimination. And the question is, where do we want to form that? Well, we have to involve the carbon with the leaving groups. So that carbon's involved. And the question is, are we going to involve either one of these carbons, which are the more substituted secondary carbons, or this carbon, which is the less substituted primary carbon. And in this case, we can see that we definitely want to use that primary carbon. And if you want to form that less substituted alkene, then you want your bulky base. And so in this case, we'll use T-butoxide. And there's our synthesis. Here's step one, here's step two, and then HBr and peroxide, step three. That completes synthesis following that pattern we just studied. So in this next example here, we've got a five carbon ring in the reactant, we've got a five carbon ring in the product, but we also have this extra carbon here. Uh, and if you recall though, the only way you can add a cyano group is through an SN2 reaction. So this is that one that's kind of the least helpful uh, way to lengthen that carbon skeleton, but through SN2. Uh, we also see that we're going to have an alkene here that we didn't have to begin with, and generally you're going to want to do E2 elimination to form an alkene rather than E1. Uh, as we discussed earlier. And so the question is here, which one are you doing uh, at the very last step? Notice we're starting with an alkyl halide rather than an alkane, so I don't for sure know what my first step is like I would as if I had an alkane. With an alkane, the only thing you can do is add a halogen, but we already have a halogen, so I don't know if I'm really doing an SN2 or E2 first and all that stuff, so we definitely should just work this backwards. So what if we decide we're going to do E2 first? Or, or I'm sorry, what if we decide E2 is the very last thing we're going to do? in this process. If that were the case, then I would need to have a good leaving group. So we'd already have the cyanide added, and I'd either need to have a good leaving group here or here. Now if I choose for it to be here, we have a fundamental problem. So in this case, with a good leaving group on a 
secondary carbon there. Uh, I could try and add a bulky base or something like that to make sure it goes E2, but the problem is, is that both adjacent carbons are secondary, and so I could form the alkene here or here, and one of those works in this my desired product, one of them is exactly would put the alkene over here, and that is not my desired product, so I'd at best only get a 50% yield. This is probably not the best way to go about this. Now, the other option... So, is to put the bromine here. So, and in this case, it's on a secondary carbon again. So, and I've got a tertiary carbon over here, secondary over here. And because there's a difference in substitution, I can kind of choose where I want that alkene to go. So, and in this case, I want it to go on the less substitute side. So, I'd probably add something like a bulky base. And so, maybe we can still accomplish this here with something like T-butoxide. Okay, so that's an option. So the other thing we might consider, instead of doing E2 as the last step, we might consider doing SN2 as the last step as well. And if that were the case, we'd already have the alkene. So, and in this case, we'd be wanting to add the cyanide in a substitution reaction for a good leaving group. And again, in synthesis, your most, kind of, your most likely good leaving group is gonna be bromine. Uh, and in this case, we would just simply wanna add something like NaCN and a good aprotic solvent like acetone, and that would be your SN2 reaction, and the cyano group would replace uh, your bromine leaving group in this case. So we could pull that off uh, and get a great yield of it. It's on a secondary carbon, but it's secondary and allylic, which actually activates it for SN2. So it'd actually be a, a decent reaction. You get a pretty decent yield. No problems there. So we've, looked up, we've got a couple of different routes to go. Either the last step we're going to do is the SN2 step, or the last step we'll do is the E2 step. Well, let's see what we can do from here. Uh, if we go back to looking at this guy right here, so the question is, am I going to try and get the bromine here? Uh, and how would I get a bromine right there? Well, to get a bromine there, it's on a secondary carbon. It's not even the most substituted carbon on here. It would actually be a little bit challenging to get a bromine there. We might be able to accomplish it after a couple of steps, but it would definitely take a, actually maybe even three steps. Uh, but it's not going to be the easiest thing in the world. So in this case, I'm going to kind of rule this out. It's not that it's impossible, but it's going to be a long synthesis. And usually, like I said, at this stage, you're probably looking at two to four steps. So if we look at this other one, though, in, in this case, uh, how would I get uh, either form the alkene or get the bromine here and stuff like this? And one thing you should focus on is that the bromine is on an allylic carbon and bells should go off in your head because you know how to allylically brominate. And so in this case, you could get a bromine, so assuming you already had the alkene, using NBS and light, or NBS and peroxide, or NBS and heat, uh, and that would exactly replace one of the hydrogens on the allylic carbon with a bromine. Do exactly as you want, great yield, no competing reactions to worry about, uh, that's what you do. And so then the last thing we need to accomplish, so is turning our alkyl halide into an alkene, and that's straight up E2 elimination. And in this case, uh, the carbon with the leaving group is a secondary carbon. The adjacent carbons are both secondary. And in fact, in this case, they're even both equivalent. It doesn't matter which one you choose, it'll, they'll both form this cycloalkene. Uh, and so in this case, uh, being that it, the leaving group's on a secondary carbon as well, if we want to make sure E2 happens, we should use the bulky base. So, and the only alkene we can form either way, whether it goes in this location or this location, is the desired one. And so in this case, your bulky base is your best choice. If you didn't use a bulky base, this would still be the major product in that case, but you'd get a minor, probably SN2 product as well. So we're going to get a little bit better yield here by using the bulky base for that step. So, but there's your synthesis. So we got step one, step two, and a three-step synthesis to get our desired product.